Good morning and welcome to the February 3rd, 2015 Executive Review Session. Uh, just an announcement, we will have lineups soon outside. They're bringing them over. We thank you for your patience. Uh, we're going to start with the SOC calendar, continued hearings, item number one, calendar number 545-56-BZ, 2001-2007 Williamsburg, Williamsbridge Road. Uh, this one we were asked to adjourn, actually. So we will adjourn. Okay, so we straight to the... Yeah, that's what I have. Okay. I didn't, I didn't see it. I didn't see it. They did a submission. Yeah. They did a submission. Uh-oh. Yeah. Sorry, did, sorry, they did a submission. I'm sorry, wrong notes. <coughs> sorry. Well, and we were missing some things Because of the submission. storm and all that stuff. So, um, they... Okay. They explain the speak. range of addresses. Mm -hmm. Because I had asked about the used car sign mm -hmm. so they showed that it actually was part of the same lot um, then they uh, revised the site plan showing a three-foot landscape buffer along the rear of the building and they submitted a letter from the property owner okay. and photos they said they submitted photos showing the graffiti and the banners removed but there were no photos right. Right. Mm -hmm. so I think they answered our questions except they never submitted the photos they said they did. They never submitted the photos. They right. They did. Okay. It did come. Okay. So any other, other than the photos, any other issue? Not for me, no. Not with me. Okay. The zoning calendar decisions, item number two, calendar number 25-14-BZ, 1601 to 1623 Avenue J. Um, this one, um, the applicant um, revised their, their plans um, to make an, a number of corrections, um, showing a side yard and trees and so on. Um, and they um, refrigerated trash room added in the subcellar that the roofs, that the terraces are going to be roofs. Um, and they clarified uh, that there are changes to the waivers requested and as a result of the changes to the building envelope and received an, uh, um, amended um, objections from the Department of Buildings. Um, they provided letters from the architect and engineer about the infeasibility of adding to the existing portion of the building, which I thought was quite persuasive um, and reasonable. Um, they responded to issue, issues about Turo College's use of the school in the evening and showed that that would absolutely have no impact on utilization rates because the school is actually much busier than the college use. Uh, the statement of facts was the statement of facts was amended to reflect all of these changes um, and the EAS was amended to reflect changes to the project and to address certain open issues. So I have no further issues with this application. I have nothing. I have no uh, problems with it either. Great. Item number three, calendar number 185-14-BZ, 14 Wall Street, Manhattan. Um, we received the certificate of no effect from LPC, so no other open issues. Anybody else? Item number four, calendar number 216-14-BZ, 150 Amsterdam Avenue, Manhattan. I have no issues with this. Anyone else? Item number five, calendar number 217-14-BZ, 245 West 17th Street, Manhattan. I have no issues with this one. Item number six, 222-14-BZ, 344 East 63rd Street, Manhattan. Also no issues with this one, another PC. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Moving on to continued hearings. Item number seven, 350-12-BZ, 532nd Street, Brooklyn. This one we did, we received a letter request to adjourn. Um, the letter request was to adjourn to March 10th and it's submitted on March 3rd, but there's only one week in between, so um, the, the hearing date would be uh, March 24th. 
Item number eight, calendar number 155-13-BZ. 1782 to 1784 East 28th Street, Brooklyn. Uh, again, we were asked to adjourn this um, submission on February 18th for a hearing on March 3rd. Item number nine, calendar number 91-14-BZ. 3420 Bedford Avenue, Brooklyn. We were asked also to adjourn this with submission on February 17th and a hearing on March 3rd. Item number 10, 114-14-BZ, 2442 East 14th Street, Brooklyn. Okay. Um, we received a revised rear yard study um, that is legible as opposed to the other one that was not. And a Sanborn and aerial photo that shows that in five cases on the block, there are back buildings, um, which are not garages. Um, and in two cases of those five, there are two stories. Um, however, none of these are actually near the site. Um, for me, so it's more information that reinforces the main issue for me, the how, that the house is set very far forward on the lot. And it's an therefore, an, it's an anomaly on this block with only a two-foot front yard. The pro proposal is to increase the house by almost two and a half times, which is an enormous increase. And if you look at lot coverage on the block in general, it is well under the proposed 60% coverage. For me, the requested floor area, uh, the requested floor area is 1.39 FAR, um, a 56% increase over the allowable, including the attic allowance. And I'm, I'm just wondering why it's assumed that that much of a request is okay. Um, and without the attic allowance, the, the FAR is 60% um, over the allowable. The, the floor plans, which are now provided dimensioned, show that the building can easily be reduced in depth to align with the neighbor at the rear that is built two stories to a 27-foot rear yard. And even then, at two stories plus an attic, this building will tower over the neighbor on the other side that has a 37-foot rear yard and only a one-story extension and a one-story garage. Um, by pulling it back to meet the neighbor, it will increase the open space on the site lower the lot coverage and floor area. Um, this, to do this, will require a reduction in the size of a closet or a bathroom, will not require their elimination as is incorrectly stated in the statement of facts. So for me, it's actually quite important that this not overwhelm the experience at the rear. Anybody else on this? Item number 11. Calendar number 118-14-BZ, 1891 Richmond Road, Staten Island. Um, so we received a revised statement of facts to remove from the list of hardships the sewer easement which was created by a predecessor and title and um, the shape of the lot which is just a nice rectangle and to remove the request for the height waiver um, the the drawings also were modified to correct the base plane analysis which clears up the floor area and height calculations um, they also revised the design detail in the front and the lower level concerning the open brick arches so now you don't see into the parking lot um, re uh, revise the financials and the zoning sheet. For me, I think this is a very good project and reasonable in light of how difficult the site constraints are. Um, the requested waiver is minimal. Um, the parking treatment, I think, is improved over the earlier project that they showed um, in the neighborhood um, as the cars are not visible from the street. So I'm fine with this application. I just had a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. oh. Um, I just wanted to clarify how they were able to eliminate the parking level from their floor area calculations. I believe it's because the height is under six feet. I just wanted to clarify that that's the waiver in the floor area they the were using. The height of what under six feet? The parking level. Uh -huh. To Above, the ceiling. To the ceiling. Oh, okay. 
above the base, above the base plane. plane. Right. It's five foot eleven, and it's under, you know under six feet. Mm. Um, I was a little confused about the building height because I still saw some height of the building above 35 feet above the new base plane. So maybe mm -hmm. they could explain that to me. And uh, I would like them to just show landscaping in the front yard. Mm -hmm. Did you say that again about the, the other issue about height? I, when I look at the um, section and they measure the 35 foot from the base plane, I still see portions of the roof oh. above that. So oh, okay, it's probably is there a dormer rule maybe? I don't know. Like that? I don't know. Is it an E that comes out? Maybe they can explain it that it, it doesn't count, or I just didn't understand that. Okay. I have a few questions mm -hmm. as well. Um, they did revise the financials, but I had asked them a question about valuing the R1 dash portion a 1-2 portion of the site in the area of no disturbance and I had asked for R1-2 comps or some sort of adjustment on the more dense comps and they have still have only one of the comps being R1-2 and the other comps are R3 so if they could either adjust it for the zoning or explain why that zoning is having no effect on the price differential that would be helpful they just have to give like a little few words in the uh, site value to justify and also since they now have storage it looks like a quite a bit of storage on four of those apartments it would be helpful if they adjust the sales prices to reflect that four of those units actually have a lot of extra space mm -hmm. okay you well Item number 12, calendar number 124-14-BZ, 1112 Gilmore Court, Brooklyn. Okay. Um, sorry, just a second. So um, they submitted a modified plan uh, showing a reduction in floor area from what was something like 1.73 to 1.48, and they accomplished this by shortening the attic at the front and the rear. Um, my main comment about that part is that the roof line is really awkward. Um, just seems like they just cut it off and to make it shorter as opposed to study the design of the house to make it um, in character with neighborhood houses. Um, what I, I have a question about the side lot line. Um, there is a portion on on one side that's set back from the side lot two foot ten. Um, that's that's sort of half the house towards the rear, and the portion towards the front on that same side lot that's set back only seven inches. And so I don't understand why how. Um, with the special permit, they can argue to continue the seven inches, fill up the two foot ten space, um, and inc essentially increase the degree of non-compliance of the existing structure. Um, that doesn't seem to comport with section 73.622.1, which states that any enlargement within a side yard shall be limited to an enlargement within an existing non-complying side yard and such a large enlargement shall not result in a decrease in the existing minimum width of open area between the building that is being enlarged and the side lot line. This proposal is filling in the two foot ten, so I actually don't think it's legitimate to pull back from there. Um, another comment is this is a 117 foot deep lot. It's extremely deep, so I'm not understanding why you need this 20 foot rear yard um, that makes more sense when you have a shallow lot. Typical lots are only 100 feet or even less, right? So I'm not getting why the 20-foot rear yard um, waiver is needed. Um, in addition, the neighbor at lot 108 that is sort of perpendicular to this lot has a two-story house that's built close to the rear lot line um, with windows facing this rear yard. 
So if the proposal were constructed as proposed, as, if the building were constructed as proposed, it would block her windows, and I doubt that this neighbor would be in favor of this application if she, he or she had been advised. Um, so I'd like to know that that neighbor has been alerted to this application. Um, with respect to the massing of the house, it's high and massive really massive compared to the neighboring houses um, based on the little information received. It's not that we have a lot of information <coughs> on this. Um, the first floor is being raised to increase the cellar height um, to a floor to first floor to cellar height of 10 feet. If you reduce that height, it would bring the height of the building down. And if you reduce the ridge height, it would bring the height of the building down and make it more in line with what the neighbor's height are. It, neighbor's heights are. Um, the, also, the roof plan is inconsistent with the sections. Doesn't look anything like the sections. Um, the crossing at the attic um, probably should be, the crossing at the attic is really bulky as opposed to dormers. We see this a lot. Um, I'm not really sure why this <coughs> is viewed as an, sort of an appropriate uh, approach to this situation. Um, and also, as we've requested with all of the other applications, we need an axonometric showing the house with the roof configuration so we can understand it better, given that there's inconsistency between the drawings. Um, and then uh, I note that this, the side of this building will be permanently completely visible because there's a, a very large parking lot next door, which is part of the adjoining house at um, 1108. Um, and this larger house, which is being used as comparison for massing, isn't comparable because it is on a very, very large zoning lot. Um, this lot is only 20 feet wide, so you, you can't have a house that would be on a 70-foot wide lot that's sitting on a 20-foot wide lot. Um, and then. Again, this house is also anomalous in that it's pulled up to within five feet of the front lot line, and the enormous increase in the massing is not respectable, respectful of the neighborhood's character. Uh, ditto for the lot coverage is atypical of the neighborhood. So from, I think the house needs to be reduced and pulled back, the rear, lot, rear yard request pulled back, and the um, neighbor adjoining contacted about what's about to happen to her windows or proposed to happen to her windows. Anybody else? Um, I had some um, similar comments about the side yard. I, I too, had a question about um, their increased um, uh, building on this, in the side yard, but also they didn't answer my question concerning the um, stairs going down to the cellar at the side yard um, because the adjacent neighbors got that sort of um, inner court at, that, at their side yard, and they don't um, say how they're actually treating that, whether that's a, a retaining wall, they're gonna have to do something um, to maintain their neighbor's um, inner court there. And I, t I too had an issue that um, they have a non-complying front yard, and um, they're only at five feet, and yet, you know, they're, um, and they've got a really deep, uh, deep lot at 117 feet. So I, I too questioned whether or not it, um, they could pull back a little bit from the 20 foot um, rear yard that they're requesting. Um, I also had a question about their um, elevation, uh, their front wall elevations. Uh, it appears that they've got a parapet, I guess, that extends um, 42 inches, which increases the height of that front wall. So I'm, I'm um, wondering if, if that can be reduced, because it seems to um, give sort of the, a, a bigger impression of the building than perhaps um, it could. There's there's some room for improvement there. Um, and let's see, was there anything else? Uh, oh, and yeah, their on their east and west elevations don't show. I don't think show the true height of that parapet. So it sort of makes it look like the front wall is really at 25, but indeed there's a, there's this parapet. Mm -hmm. so. Well, I looked up this address on the FEMA flood maps and it's actually in a flood zone mm -hmm. in an A E flood zone with a base flood elevation of plus 10 which they have never they have not addressed at all so 
They need to show that it's <laughs> <laughs> compliant. I don't even think they can have a seller. They yeah. probably have to fill it in. And um, they need to show us, um, you know, they have to convert their elevations to a certain um, basis, mm -hmm. which is, uh, you know, compatible with the FEMA flood elevation. So that's basically a redesign. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Okay, that cuts to the chase. <laughs> well, in the redesign that's complying with FEMA, all of these others, so that's an opportunity to really go back to the drawing board. That's an opportunity to look at all of these issues regarding the massing. Any other issues? Okay. Item number 13, calendar number 177-14-BZ. 1038 Flatbush Avenue, Brooklyn. Okay. Um, they revised the statement of facts to address the open issues concerning the sound attenuation and that the stop work order was issued to another prop, uh, another to the landlord unrelated to this use or to right. So I don't have any other issues on this. No. Item number 14, calendar numbers 285, 286, 288-14-BZ, 84 McLaughlin Street, 20 Orlando Street, and 131 Cedar Grove Avenue, Staten Island. Uh, we were asked to adjourn this just till next week, 210, February 10. I'll call out numbers 15, 16 through 17. They're all part of the Build It Back program. Calendar numbers 297-14-BZ through 300-14-A. That's 6 and 28 Topping Street. Item number 16, 307-14-BZ, 540 Hunter Avenue. And item number 17, 308, 310, and 312-14-BZ, 179 Kiswick Street, 297 Colony Avenue, and 65 Hempstead Avenue all on Staten Island. And we were asked to adjourn all of these to February 10th. Zoning calendar new cases, item number one, calendar number 301-13-BZ, 1502 Avenue N, Brooklyn. Okay, so um, this is a request to enlarge an existing one-story and basement synagogue. Um, with, for, um, a, a, let's say a yeshiva college and adding dormitories to it. Um, it requests a lot of, let's see this, it's, um, sorry. It requests an increase in floor area front to four FAR where the as of right is two, so it's double. Um, and it requests um, four stories, so it's very much higher. It's 40, I believe it's 45 feet, so it's much higher. Sorry, to 50, 58 feet. Sorry, 58 feet high, where the as of right is 35 feet. So it's very much taller than everything else in the neighborhood. Um, the the statement of facts describes that it needs that. For the school aspect of it, they need four classrooms to increase the student body from 150 to 180 students, and um, that and also to serve existing needs. So that's a total of six classrooms, um, which provides for one room for each of five grades, effectively, and one swing swing space, and to enlarge the bait midras. The proposal includes 10 dormitories to house 64 students ex accessory to the college. And the ex um, explanation for the dormitory need is that so the students may spend more time engaged in their studies. Um, they, but it says that the non-dormitory students, or actually all the students at the moment, live within five blocks of the school. Um, the, for me, there's a there are actually a, a enormous amount of questions on this. So, um, first, in terms of the submission, um, I'm trying to understand. There's an existing non-complying um, building, 
and uh, I'd like to understand how come it's not complying. Is it a pre-61 building? Was it built pursuant to a permit? Uh, it has non-compliances with respect to lot coverage, front and side yard conditions, um, and um, I'm not sure whether those were permitted obstructions um, because it's community facility. I need to understand why it's not complying. Um, the in order to establish the case for a, a school use here, uh, we need to really understand programmatic need um, and it's not at all clear how these spaces are used. So I need clarity on how the basement space and the synagogue spaces are used during the school hours. Um, the statement of facts uses different terminology than the drawings. So on the drawing, the statement of facts says the main study hall um, and the plans say social hall at the basement and synagogue at the first floor, so I don't know which one is the main <coughs> study hall. The, the program description and statement, <coughs> statement of fact never mentions meanings in the synagogue space. Not really sure how the synagogue is used in this context. Um, also, the statement of facts describes a multi-purpose dining room, and which is also not shown on the plans. Is that the social hall? Um, What's the warming kitchen for? I believe there's a warming kitchen, which doesn't seem to be um, used. Um, the planned space designations just don't agree at all. So um, you need to show on the, existing, on the existing drawings with box labels, so with little boxes that you fill in with information, how the program currently operates in this building, in this existing building, and then show on the proposed drawings how it's proposed to operate provide scheduling information of each room and assign student counts to each room for each scheduled use. That way we understand whether there is overcrowding, whether there is a shortage of spaces or and, and therefore a need for expansion of the classrooms. Um, my next question is where are the dorm students from who attend the yeshiva? Um, if, if everyone right now is within five blocks, therefore walking distance, then what's the need for a dormitory? Um, I, I'm curious why the dorm rooms can't be located off-site in residential buildings in the area. Um, I, I understand that people already are renting apartments in the area, and, and, and it says since the rigorous program um, starts at 7.30 a.m. and ends at 10.45 p.m., um, can be attended by day students who live nearby. It's already established because not everyone's going to live in the dorms. Why can't local housing accommodate the 64 dorm students? Um, the reasoning that's given for why a dormitory is needed here is that the students are spending money to rent apartments near the yeshiva. That's not a programmatic requirement. Um, or that parents want their children closely supervised. The, that's also not a programmatic need. Um, it must be essential to the learning process to have the dormitory on site and that hasn't been established. By not having dorm rooms, you reduce the bulk, which is the issue. And I, I note that most universities require that students spend hours at their classes and in the library, laboratory, or studio. As an architecture student, I practically lived in the studio. I got home at four in the morning, so 11 o'clock, that's early for an architecture student. And, um, and, and students in both urban and suburban schools often live in apartments away from the school. So perhaps there's a lesser variance that does not overwhelm the neighborhood or require as many waivers to accommodate some of the students who are freshly arrived from abroad. So I understand that if you have students coming from Israel and they don't know their way around and maybe there's some kind of reasoning that could be given why they need to live on, on campus or in this building, but um, there's no re need for everyone to. Um, with respect to the parking and the bike storage, um, the parking calcs are based on the enlargement and the existing one parking space that's there already for the synagogue is required for the existing use to remain. So unless that use is being eliminated, the shortfall is 16 spaces, not 15. Um, we need to know what's the distance to public transport. And, and all of those students who are going to be living there um, how do they get around if not by car or bike? Um, 
So it can't be that everyone walks within five blocks and everything they need is within five blocks and then that's that. Um, the, the statement of facts describes social functions. What are those? Um, who attends these? How do they get to it? And what is the number of attendees? Uh, that goes to traffic issues and the use of the building. Also, how do the faculty arrive at the site? Will there be faculty sleeping in the dorms as well? I didn't notice any private rooms for the faculty. Um, I noticed seven people sleeping in a room together. Wouldn't get much sleep. <laughs> That's a rough life dormitory. <laughs> um, and with respect to the seeker analysis, the EAS um, I note is incorrect and assumes there is no enlargement to the existing structure. Where is it? What? <laughs> the proposed um, application could impact traffic, parking, pedestrian circulation, urban design, shadows. You have to go back and do the EAS over, do it. Um, and also, because this is a very large proposed enlargement, we need a streetscape study showing both sides of both streets, because it's a corner lot. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and um, I, I, too, um, had um, concerns about uh, the legal or non-legal condition of this building. Um, it's not really explained um, why it's um, non-complying. How did it get built that way? And um, I think they need to kind of um, expand on that. Uh, their current CO is for a synagogue and not a school, so this is going to be an addition. Um, and uh, so their current, even the current use is probably not um, uh, not legal in a sense. Um, their as a right scheme seems to be exaggerated. Um, the stair bulkheads, are, to me, are un un necessarily large, um, as well as the elevator um, uh, override seems to be really, you know, sort of out of scale. Um, so I think that, that they kind of need to go back and take a look at what a, uh, a good as a right scheme might, um, they might derive uh, uh, even better square footage if they just really think about how to use the space. Um, it was not clear to me how uh, how much square footage they need really per student, uh, how that's laid out, how do the students utilize the space in general. I mean, it's, it's not clear to me um, if there are simultaneous uses. They don't really talk about how the building is used by the current student population, which would then inform us whether or not they need additional space for an additional 30 students. They also don't um, explain um, how they came up with the number of needing to board so many students. Um, is it that they get a certain amount of applications um, every year for uh, students who seek to board and they can't fulfill that? So um, I think they need to um, flesh that out considerably. Um, let's see, there's more. Uh, and they, took, they show us some of these sort of the existing spaces that haven't been um, enlarged to accommodate new students. So for instance, like that kitchen space. Mm -hmm. You would think if you've got, now you've got um, 60 people living there that they're going to be utilizing that space 24 seven, utilizing the building. So um, the kitchen, I should assume, would need to be enlarged um, to be able to accommodate more meals. I guess, you know, as adults, we get up in the middle of the night, we get hungry, we want to eat something. So. Um, the building itself is, is really being used more intensely, and I don't think they really talk about that. They said they order or take out. <laughs> That's an expensive um, thing. I think you probably would utilize a kitchen <laughs> every now and then. I don't know. I, too, in architecture school was up till, you know, 4 a.m. And, and lived in my studio, and we had, we had a little kitchen facility that we used constantly. So, um, indeed, it's when you're boarding, it's, it's very different from living at home. Okay. Um, I think that since they're asking for extra floor area, I think it's really important for them to reference some sort of educational standard that would validate their need for the size classrooms and the size dormitory rooms that they have. Mm -hmm. um, they gave us a daily schedule, which I really didn't understand. Yeah, I didn't either. They, so. They have to translate it for mm -hmm. me. 
right. Well, that's why putting it on the plan and showing how many students where and yeah. what they're doing, yes. And then I agree that they're proposing a building which is double, over double in height of the two adjacent buildings and on one side on Avenue N, they don't even have any side yard. It's right on the property line which seems overwhelming. And as far as the EAS is concerned, I think adjacent to the, like one house over, there is some sort of track. I'm not sure if it's active, if it's subway or railroad. That should, they did no noise Maybe testing. Right mm -hmm. oh, okay. So that should be done. Mm -hmm. That's it. Okay, great, thank you. Item number two, calendar number 303-13-BZ, 506-2510, Brook Avenue, Bronx. Okay, this is a, an application for a project by um, Sobro in, in Bronx for, for 31 affordable housing units between uh, 50 and 60% of AMI. Um, it's, uh, I just note that the phase, phase one has been completed. Um, and I believe that uh, there's a DEP letter that says there's a phase two that's needed. Um, this is a, is a corner lot where they're removing one existing tenement building and will relocate the tenants to other Sobro housing. Um, and they're asking for an increase over the, as of right, um, residential floor area of three to 4.47 FAR. But I want to note that in this district, the um, 4.8 FAR is allowed for a community facility. So the difference between what's the total, which is 4.94 when you combine the church use and the residential use together, it's not a significant increase in allowable bulk. So that should be discussed in the statement of finding of facts and findings because um, it's a way to support the, <clears throat> the mass of the building. Um, so, um, they also very interestingly gave quite a lot of information about how the project will be financed. I'm not sure exactly whether that's needed because this is a not-for-profit, but it was helpful for me to understand that. Um, in terms of the argument for uniqueness, um, the they talk about um, poor load-bearing capacity requiring a Matt Slab Foundation and the um, the existing adjacent building, which causes a lot of difficulties in terms of shoring and bracing and stabilization, because arguably it's it's a it's sitting on weak soil, <coughs> and that represents a an eight hundred eighteen thousand dollar premium um, for them, which is basically the unique physical condition. Um, they're making reference, though, to um, a common ground project that's just down the street and says that they have similar um, soil conditions. So, and then there was a statement in the statement of facts that cites to a case that doesn't require that they be the only site um, to have, suffer from a unique condition, but on the other hand, you can't be one of many. So I, I think that needs more um, beefing up um, and to find out maybe from engineers what they're finding in other sites in the neighborhood um, uh, whether and and yeah and so that in combination perhaps with the, the difficulty of working with the existing build uh, the adjacent building maybe that's enough to establish the uniqueness but the uniqueness needs some some additional clarification um, then um, just some clarity on the drawings a statement of facts that's that the building height is 58 foot 8 inches, but the zoning calcs on, on the drawings show 68 and a maximum base height of 60 with a required setback. The elevations show that it's 58 foot 8, but also 68 feet to the top of the trash mechanical room and elevator room. And I'm not sure whether, because it's quite a large structure, whether all of that's a permitted obstruction, in which case there's, there's a non-compliance with height and setback. So that should be clarified and coordinated. Um, 
with there should be a please provide a roof plan there was none provided and if the roof tear a roof plan as in on top of the mechanical there's a kind of roof level that shows the mechanical rooms um, and also is if the roof terrace is open to the tenants doesn't it need an elevator stop there? I don't, it doesn't, the elevator is not stopping at the roof. Um, in terms of the context, the, the photographs are not broad enough to understand this context of this building, so um, please provide a photo streetscape. Um, and also, with respect to the comparison, there was kind of, there was an area map, but it's very hard to understand in, in the area map that actually whether these buildings that are say five stories are as tall as this proposed six story building because many of the five story buildings are older and they may have had very high floor to floor heights. So um, you really need to kind of tie all that together with the imagery and the area map to make it clear that you can support the height of this building. Um, the statement of facts also didn't discuss the impacts on the area of not providing any parking, um, increased lot coverage or density. It needs to go through each of the requested waivers in the statement of, of findings. Uh, and also, uh, with respect to the EAS, I'm not understanding why it didn't look at the impact of no parking spaces. And there is no preliminary analysis provided of any of the environmental issues where the answer was yes on the checklist. So basically, there is no backup at all in the EAS. Um, and then, uh, indeed, DEP uh, in, on January 20th provided a letter indicating that, the phase two, that a phase two needs to be conducted. Um, and I think that's it. Um, I think you covered um, a lot of what I was going to say. I just wanted to um, sort of focus back in on the, the parking. Um, I was a little confused whether or not that community facility portion required any parking. Um, and maybe they could tell us sort of the percentage or their, their projected percentage of residents that would have a car or don't have a car or the area in which um, this is situated that most people don't drive. Um, that would be helpful um, in determining whether parking um, would be needed. Also, they talk about uh, part of their premium cost um, would have been to install an elevator if they were going to align floors or they couldn't align floors with the existing building, so therefore it would require an elevator that would have to um, have additional stops sort of on each side of the, um, of the new building to the existing building. And it wasn't clear to me why they would not have aligned the floors in their new portion. Um, so um, if they could flesh that out, um, they just simply say part of the, uh, the cost of, an obs of the obsolete building would be that we wouldn't be able to align the floors, and I'm not sure but that I just I understand I'm just that. a question of whether they need to go there if they're looking at this as a vacant lot. So then they started off in the statement of facts to talk about the obsolescence of this one tenement, right. but then they didn't use it in the rest of the discussion. So it's kind of like, sort of like a throw, like they're, they're working on a vacant lot and the vacant building, the, sorry, the tenement building doesn't seem to be a factor. So. Well, they, they probably have to sort of neither fish nor foul. They have to come down on one side or the other. Yeah. Right. Okay. So they, yeah, right, exactly. You have to say we're going to hand, taking this as a vacant lot and right. Uh, that's all I had. Because it's true they include demolition costs. So if you take it as a vacant lot, maybe you don't include demolition costs. I, I'm not. But, or you don't use that as your unique condition. It's just the cost of doing construction on the site is not unique to the site. Well, I, I actually had a question about that, that citing the complication of the demolition of the obsolete five-story building plus the underpinning of the tenement next door is that really unique in that area because when you do have abutting and attached buildings in that neighborhood so many things are old and obsolete is this a unique condition particular to this site or one or two other sites in the area or is this something that's commonly found so not that they couldn't include it in the cost but that it wouldn't be stated as a unique factor and the only it might be unique because it's also sitting on very unstable soil so that so right is yeah, the that soil unstable right. so could it be yes like you said the combination of both of those things that are actually no other site actually really has two properties like that okay that would be helpful 
Yeah, I just felt that their A finding, I thought, was pretty well established, actually, you know, between the obsolete building with the rubble foundation wall and the loose soil conditions. Um, you know, I thought they backed that up pretty well, and they only put the incremental costs in their hardship, and mm -hmm. I actually was satisfied with that, even though it was similar to a site across the street. Mm -hmm. yeah. So when you're saying the rubble wall foundation of the ex of the tenement to be demolished, or are no, you talking the, about they, the adjacent building? They're demolishing to to a shared par party wall, right? Which is sitting on a rubble foundation, okay. rubble okay. stone foundation. Mm -hmm. Which is, okay. you know, not that secure, mm -hmm. not that stable. Right. Okay. Okay. Right. Okay. Item number three, calendar number 309 13 BZ, 965 East 24th Street, Brooklyn. Okay. Um. So this is a 73-622 enlargement um, of a single family house on a 40 by 100 lot. Um, there is a sandboard map that shows uh, the footprint of the house existed in 1950. Um, it's proposed to increase the FAR to 1 um, and um, reduce the side yard, the rear yard to 20 from 25. Um, the building is 36 foot high, 8 inches high to the peak. Um, so the things that I observed was that the 20 foot, um, the statement of fact states that the 20 foot rear yard reduced open space ratio, this is something I just want generally corrected on the applications. The 20 foot rear yard, the reduced open space ratio, lot coverage and side yards are quote, permitted pursuant to ZR 73-622. That is not a correct statement. 73-622 is a special permit, and if the findings are met, and if it is granted, it may per permit waivers to this extent, but these are not permitted as of right. That's, that's, this is a discretionary approval. Um, there's also generally no discussion in the statement of facts to support the rear yard reduction or any other waivers other than the floor area. Each one of those requested waivers needs to be supported in the statement of facts and findings. Um, in order for us to understand where the give is on this building, we need interior dimensions on the plans to show room sizes. Um, this, there's a drawing of the streetscape, which is actually kind of includes more houses than is usual, so um, it was quite informative. Um, the streetscape drawing shows clearly that the house is too massive and tall compared to its neighbors, so bring the height of the attic down and um, help us understand better this neighborhood by providing streetscape photos um, and provide a case for the reduction of the rear yard to 20 feet. Uh, provide rear yard studies and photos taken from the rear yard of the surrounding properties. These are standard requests now for these applications. Anybody else? I noticed that in their application they had given us a prior pr proposed um, enlargement plan which I felt looked more in neighborhood character than the revised one mm -hmm. in terms of its, you know, attic right. outline and Maybe they should go back to that. <laughs> <laughs> and this, I think it was over two feet shorter. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Item number four, calendar number 60-14-BZ, 141-4177, 41, -41 72nd Avenue, Queens. A difficult one. This is a legalization of an existing um, synagogue, basically, um, and it, and its enlargement. So synagogue and school and its enlargement. Um, the first uh, comment I have is the we need some clarity from the community board. Their their report was extremely confusing. I think the full board voted against it and the committee voted in favor, but. It's very hard to understand what's going on. Um, given how much opposition there was, how many opposition letters, I have trouble believing 
that the community board voted in favor, maybe the committee wasn't didn't have the um, have the testimony from the neighbors the way the full board did. I, I can't really figure it out. But there is a huge amount of opposition from neighbors for this. Um, we received many, many letters. Um, and so that makes me really pay attention what's what's going on here, right? And so one of the things that's going on here is the building was built illegally. Um, it received a permit in um, 1997, um, and uh, which in the statement of facts says resulted in non-compliances in 2000. But we might wonder how did that result in non-compliances when you go online and you see easily that there was a stop work order issued and there was work that continued to go on despite the stop work order. So my first question is kind of why just sort of conceptually does the applicant think that that's a, that's, that's a good way to start here? <laughs> and then they want more. So, um, so they, and they want to enlarge this, this building that doesn't comply with side yards, rear yards, front yards, height, nothing. So, okay, so just starting off with the idea that it's not a happy beginning. Um, the, it, it states that there's a confused discussion in the statement of facts about the, that it was a high school and then it was a something kind of school and now it's another kind of a school. But I think the end result is that it's a pre-nursery and a pre-K. Um, but please clarify, does that mean there's still high school kids coming in here sometimes or is it totally now a pre-nursery and pre-K? Um, what I'm getting from it is there's 72 students ages two to seven, which is kind of old for pre-K, um, who come from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. and that there is also an early a.m. and a late afternoon after school program for what age people, um, for working parents who need to drop their kids off during those times or have those kids there. Um, the, uh, and the proposal is to increase the size of the building to meet growing demand. Um, so it says that they don't, the kids don't get there by busing because they come from the immediate area. And I note that there's a Department of Transportation no parking sign right in front of the synagogue or school or whatever. Um, but I note that this is an extremely bad neighbor who, who have submitted letters with many, many complaints con concerning parking school bus drop-off, which I don't totally understand, but so maybe they meant school drop-off, mismanagement of children running around in the streets without being supervised, even though the statement of fact says that there's a school monitor, so there's a real answer there someplace, um, that children don't have a place to play, therefore they run around in the streets, that there are building violations, there's illegal construction, as I've said, and that the project will have an impact on the sewer system, and they just go on and on. Granted, some of these things are not within the control of the applicant, but it sounds like a lot of them are. So, I want to know, um, uh, first, there's uh, many, many violations against this building. What are, what are the proposals to cure the open violations that have been open since 2000, so it's 15 years later, um, which include a school operating without a fire alarm system? doesn't give us great warmth and hope that you're going to, that the applicant is going to um, comply with the BSA's requirements. How can we um, convince, how can you convince us that you're not just going to continue to be a bad actor? Um, also, occupancy of a large space with more than 75 people without a public assembly permit, etc. cetera. Um, and um, then there's just some other things there that the statement of fact says uh, that you can take advantage of non-complying side yards because that there was a house that was originally here. And it's not clear at all what happened, but I, I suspect that it was just demoed. But um, the house didn't have complying side yards. And so when you look on the drawings, there's this little section that indicates that, it, that that part of the side yard is not non-complying, that one's good and the other parts are good, and I'm not understanding why, why that would be fine. So if anything, let's be honest and apply to cure all of the non-compliances and not 
pick and choose like that. Um, then there is a proposal to reduce the apparent floor area to make the basement a cellar. That is an interesting task when the base plane is at elevation 70 and the basement floor is at elevation 65.6. .6. So that means you've got, you know, four and a half feet qualifying as cellar. That, that doesn't work. The cellar height is 13 feet. I, I'm not understanding. You can't just raise the first floor up to almost 10 feet and say that the thing below it is a base is a cellar. It doesn't work. So I think that's incorrect and that their floor area request will therefore be much more than what's proposed. Um, the elevator at the alley in the side yard, which is being proposed to deal with um, ADA requirements, which were illegally not provided in 2000, um, it probably is not an acceptable solution because the rule is that you have to have access to the main entrance by a disabled person, and this puts you down the alley and coming in the side door. And the first floor, especially after that raising, is nearly 10 feet above curb level. So there needs to be another solution there, unless you get a waiver from the office on, Mayor's Office on Disability. Um, the drawings also state that there's no parking required for the synagogue, but zoning resolution section 2531 requires an R4 one per 15 persons of rated capacity unless that's waived by the city planning commission by um, special permit i think no by certification um, the statement of facts says that 300 people attend these services on weekends and 200 on weekdays so the parking issue needs to be addressed for other than sabbath events um, and um, you need to show, oh, the building heights are all described on these drawings as in, in elevation, so it actually requires us to do math. It would be a lot more, a lot easier to review if we could have all the building heights measured above curb level or base plane. Um, uh, there's, there is a play area, hallelujah, provided on the roof proposed. Um, you should show fencing around the play area in the elevations and call it out. We need to understand this clearly. How tall is this building? Um, bulkheads should be dimensioned. They're not. Um, and the proposed height of this building is 10 feet greater than the allowable. So how do you justify a 13 foot high cellar? Um, we need more photographs to show the neighborhood context. Um, the um, there was a photo streetscape that was provided just of the zoning district boundary, within the zoning district boundary, um, and it makes a case that the existing building is totally, I mean, that the existing building, never mind the proposed, is totally out of context with the neighborhood. So what's the case for this being in context? Um, I'd suggest there might be a relationship to the commercial overlay that's immediately next door on Main Street. Uh, this needs to be studied much more carefully. Um, we need a rendering of the building in context uh, to see how this addition would be handled. Um, and there was a map provided of community facilities um, to, for what purpose, I'm not really sure. Only two of which were within 400 feet of the site. Uh, all of those buildings that were provided um, are, very, are, are on very large lots. Um, so I'm not sure what the purpose of the proposal was community facility is permitted in residence districts, so I don't know why that was provided. Um, and then um, how, what would be the method for addressing the drop-off nuisance that the neighbors are complaining of so much and um, addressing the issue of children unsupervised and so on running all around. Um, uh, there is no information about how food service is operated here for the school. Um, how does the faculty arrive at the school? Do they, uh, do they park? Do they drive? How did the congregants come? Um, and then finally, in terms of this is supposed to be a school where you need to establish programmatic need. So as in the other application, you have to provide a daily schedule of events 
at how each room is occupied with how many adults and children for each event in the schedule. It should show on the plan. You can show this on the plans, or must show this on the plans, and also describe it in the statement of facts. Um, and it should be shown both on the existing, how does the existing building work, and then how it, is it proposed to work. That's it. Next. <laughs> um, I, yes and yes. Um, I am really very concerned about the permit and violation history on this building. Um, they've had an open permit uh, for, uh, since 1998, uh, and it's unclear to me exactly how they sort of resurrected this, um, this permit so that the new architect could even take over the job. So I think they, they have to explain that. Um, it, it doesn't appear to me that they are able to really show us that the building was built according to zoning even back in 1997 or 98. So um, there may be uh, additional sort of illegal portions of the building that we're not aware of, and I, I think they need to um, describe that um, in detail to us. Um, in no particular order, could we get some photos of the rear as well? Um, it's not clear to me exactly what's happening back there, so um, if we can see um, what exactly has been built at the rear. And I guess there's a right of way at the rear as well, and they don't really discuss that. Um, if they can describe more fully um, how the current arrangement of the synagogue space and the community room doesn't benefit their program now and why they, they need to um, uh, expand that and, and uh, make the building larger. There are four classrooms. They don't describe how those are currently used, so we don't know why they would need additional classrooms. Um, the worship spaces seem to have decreased in size on the first floor and um, devoting more space to, um, to the school function, I suppose, so they don't really discuss what happens to that portion of their programming in the building. Are there now fewer um, adults attending worship services? Or they, it seems that there's a shift in what their programming is going to be, so they need to really discuss that. Um, uh, and I don't understand why the elevator can't be inboard, why it needs to sit just because they have um, what is a questionable handicap lift back there. Um, I don't see how that converts to an elevator necessarily in the side yard. Mm -hmm. um, they're only adding six classrooms, and I'm wondering if there's uh, the ability to kind of rejigger where those classrooms are and utilize their cellar slash basement space, not sure exactly what that is, um, to accommodate that, which would then allow them perhaps to um, have a shorter building. Uh, so they, they need to talk about that. And the number of the students on the plan does not correspond to the number of students claimed in the facts. There are over 100 on the plans, but I think they only really talk about 75 additional people. So um, I think they have a lot of work to do. This is a very, very strange application. Yes, it is. Um, I think, which is what's happened in some other applications, the number of students on the plans is rated capacity as mm -hmm. opposed to their intent, but they need to make that to clear. make that clear. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I, I agree with everything that's been said concerning the programmatic needs. It seems to me that they need to really provide a more detailed analysis of what their program is. They talk about the increase in enrollment. They don't say how long it's going to take to get to that target. They uh, don't talk about what their plan is for adding grades. They don't talk about how many grades the building's ultimately going to serve. I also agree that um, it's, not, it's not clear whether or not all of the spaces are going to be used simultaneously. They don't talk about, you know, how many children per class ultimately they're going to have and how many classes per grade they're ultimately going to have. And also, they don't really discuss the hours of operation of the rooftop play area. And I think that's important, being that they're surrounded by residential mm -hmm. on a couple of sides. And just a couple, couple of things. I think, you know, especially in terms of the younger children, there are Department of Health guidelines for the age of the child, the number in each room, and the number of caregivers. And I'm not sure that what I see on the plans complies with that. Um, and I was concerned that they have a congregation of 300 with an adequate synagogue now when they're going to 
cut the size of the synagogue significantly where it can only fit 106 people. I think they should show trash, refrigerated trash storage in the building because there have been many complaints about um, their trash handling. And if there's any conditions regarding um, the easement at the rear, um, you know, in terms of what is actually required, is it supposed to remain free and clear of all obstructions? You know, how is that um, shown on the deed? Are there, what are the conditions of that? And do they have a copy of the alteration plans that they filed and received a permit for but didn't follow? Item number five, calendar number 154-14-BZ, 6934 Fifth Avenue, Brooklyn. Okay. This is a kind of a, a quirky little application. <laughs> um, it's a proposal to add, a, well, to get a, essentially a waiver to allow a 10% increase in floor area, or not quite 10% increase in floor area, and um, to allow the construction of a little one-story addition to this kind of the side of a corner tenement building um, and it's uh, a 600 square feet one-story addition I you know I just note that if you kind of wander around the city in, in sort of classic parts of town like the one that I think of easiest is actually in Chinatown um, you see those kind of little attached newsstands there's a woman who makes uh, like little Chinese waffly things and stuff like that you do see those those kinds of additions that have been made so I think of it as a typical sort of typology in the city with respect to these tenement buildings um, for convenience shops and things like that and and so I actually have no problem with this except that I note that the, the building itself is a very beautiful tenement building. It's in really good condition and has beautiful detailing. And I would just hope that this little addition does that justice, that it's not just, it's rendered as concrete block. So I'm hoping that that's not what we're gonna see. <laughs> Anybody else? The only thing I had a little concern about was, you know, they have to prove that the building was in existence in 1961 and what they gave us was an alt Mm -hmm. um, file number from 1920 something. I just thought maybe if they could give us something and a little, yeah, yeah, something a bit more definitive. Mm -hmm. You know, since that's like a threshold question. So, I mean, it's and if they could give us a survey just to clarify or right. the dimensions. Yeah, it's kind of an odd lot that has so much mm -hmm. side space that's not developed. Maybe there was a road widening or something like that. Anyone else? Item number six, calendar number 232-14-BZ, 946 Pennsylvania Avenue. Okay, uh, another um, PC. Um, so we have the Department of Investigation, the Fire Department sign off, and the only thing I note, because this is in a one, in a two-story, gigantic commercial building, so the only issue really is about the noise to adjoining tenants, um, because I see lots of running <coughs> machines and that kind of stuff. So again, um, we need details on noise separation for the, from the adjoining tenants, and other than that, I don't have any other issues. I had a question about, uh, I guess the CFO mentions a parking lot, and um, they didn't really mention parking, but is parking available, or is it required? Mm -hmm. okay. This concludes the February 3rd, 2015 ses executive session. Nice.